So I'm in the uh, Department of Psychiatry and um, Neurosciences. Uh, what is it? Uh, I can't even say it. Uh, and, um, neurobio uh, whatever it is, neurobiology. And then on, um, NPI, Neuropsychiatric Institute, sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and I direct this brand new center that we have, the Center for Social Medicine. Um, and what I'll be talking about, I've been working for the past three decades with homeless heroin injectors drug sellers and violent youth. Um, and this first picture that we're about to bring up is, um, is, is a homeless encampment in San Francisco where I followed some two dozen injection drug users for 12 years, analyzing their survival strategies and interface with medical services and law enforcement. The field work um, actually is presented in, an, in a photo ethnographic book that I co-authored with Jeff Sean, who, who took all the Photographs that, that we'll be seeing. Oh, yeah, I, they're, they're about to come up. Um, and I normally, oh, this is good because they, they haven't come up yet. I, I normally warn most audiences that many of the photographs um, are will be, are jarring um, and and um, but but um, I I hope that they're I I know that many of you are clinicians and routinely deal with with uh, extraordinary levels of pathology and suffering. And I think that the photographs are, um, um, <clears throat> are necessary for us to, uh, to, to be able to believe the levels of, uh, the inconceivable levels of physical suffering of homeless heroin injectors. And also from a medical perspective, the, the extraordinarily unsanitary physical environments uh, in which they, um, in which they, they, they live. Um, but I did include um, one energetic, beautiful photo just to give you a, a better idea of the energy that, that also exists uh, in these sites simultaneously. So we were using, as Vivek was describing, the classic methods of participant observation ethnography. I didn't actually that frequently sleep in the encampments. I maybe did it a, a dozen or two dozen times. But um, um, participate, per, participant observation, the classical anthropological technique, is, is actually quite powerful because it allows you to triangulate direct observation with self-report, and it becomes especially useful um, in, in when dealing with taboo subjects and legal subjects um, and, and, and subjects that people are, are, um, are ashamed to talk about or know that they're stigmatized. So um, I'll just run through briefly. Um, I want to convey then um, just in passing the, the uh, no, I want to start with the potential of cultural relativism. Um, uh, and um, and um, and 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 the anthropological sensibility more more broadly, which can improve relationships with outcomes of difficult and non-adherent patients, most notably in this case the, the the homeless heroin injectors that I'll be talking about. But more importantly, this requires recognizing the structural vulnerability, the structural forces, and, and the cultural normative values that often result in these contradictory priorities between uh, health providers and patients and um, leads to a failure to understand the logics for the extraordinarily risky behaviors of, non, of many non-adherent non patients. That leads us often um, into the all too commonsensical trap of dismissing these individuals as self-destructive pathological outliers unworthy of medical <laughs> treatment and social services and empathy. So specifically then, what I, what I want to do is operationalize the social science concept of structural vulnerability and the health risk environment to propose it as a practical clinical tool or even a simple quantitative checklist. Um, uh, ideally, this could extend the medical purview behind the, but beyond the biological and individual patient confines to more upstream institutional policy and, and supportive services, um, as well as infrastructural logistical interventions that either do not require behavior change or create the support infrastructure to achieve less risky lifestyle changes more realistically. Um, so then very, very 
briefly the 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 concept of, of um, cultural relativism is just a heuristic technique a, a tool it's not a theory um, and it's uh, very very simple no no culture is good or bad it just has a logic our our, our job is to understand the logic if we want to understand anything about why people are behaving the way they do in this in this cultural setting or this social setting um, the um, concept of risk environment comes out of the 19th century uh, social epidemiologist Rudolf Virchow, um, and, and who's also a pathologist. And it actually sort of continues through today. You can think of the work of Paul Farmer, the charismatic anthropologist and infectious disease global health doctor, uh, who's chair of social medicine at Harvard. Um, and the concept and specific dimensions one chooses to emphasize uh, in, in, from the risk environment, some of which I, I listed here, also draw on concepts that I'm sure many of you have, have worked with, you know, from social determinants of health, eco-social models of health, upstream factors in health, and fundamental, there, there's lots of terms um, that, that are eliciting this, these, these concerns. Um, structural vulnerability um, is a more recent adaption of a social science concept to medical care. Um, and many of the, again, many of the forces and characteristics that comprise structural vulnerability are somewhat commonsensical. But they're, all, they're commonsensical only if you have time to think about them in the pressured context of the very short clinical encounter. And so the goal of the assessment tool that I'll be presenting at the end of this, in the hopes that one of you will maybe invent an app for it, um, <laughs> it is, um, um, it, it is is to precisely allow this to happen without having to, you know, major in social sciences or, or even care about the social sciences to a certain extent. So in sum, structural vulnerability is a product of a patient's social position in the diverse networks of overlapping power relations and hierarchies in which all individuals, um, are, 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 us included, are inevitably embedded. Uh, it's, the concept, it's the outcome of a combination of one's assumed or attributed status, including uh, subtler things like health-related deservingness, um, normality, conventionality, credibility, intelligence, uh, imputed, <laughs> imputed honesty, and so forth, as well as more easily and objectively measurable socioeconomic and demographic um, uh, attributes that any given society, uh, you know, hierarchizes and stigmatizes gender, social class, race, sexuality, citizenship, status, and so forth. And of course, then also policy trends combined with these, combine with these, or mesh with these symbolic and demographic markers and institutionalized forces to position individuals differentially within specific political, economic, and institutional sites in ways that affect health and long-term outcomes. Um, in practical terms, then, structural vulnerability is the confluence of forces that on some level limit agency and the ability to pursue healthy lifestyles. In, in the United States, the one I always try to bold on a PowerPoint is, is, is social class, just because it's such an extraordinarily invisibilized concept for, for, for us culturally. Um, stigma against non-normative or socially unconventional behaviors and, and illegal practices is also often misrecognized as just one's moral common sense um, and, and becomes conflated with, with, with unworthiness. So I also wanted to um, uh, um, emphasize that as well. But I'll be talking uh, today um, about the legal status of, of heroin injectors as a structural vulner as a force generating structural vulnerability. And I'll read from uh, a field note ex excerpt to show to, that tries to show how the risk the risk environment of zero tolerance policing um, um, emerges as a force fomenting injection practices that increase the risk of infectious disease for street-based injectors. And most, most specifically, it's, it's increasing abscesses, but also increasing hepatitis C and, and HIV. So, um, the, the note then. There's been yet another round of evictions, and Hank is shivering at the, at, on the corner at wit's end. He tells us, the highway patrol wiped me out again. That means they bulldozed his shack, taking all his blankets, clean syringes from the needle exchange, clothes, and so forth. He adds, I'm tempted to get my gun and shoot the next patrol car that I see. 
Max walks into the walks by and puts his arm around Hank's shoulder, attuned to, my, uh, to Max do, Max's dope sickness. That, that is to say, his on oncoming opiate withdrawal symptoms. He was shivering and 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 the mucus was running down his nose. Um, he offers to treat him to a taste of heroin. They immediately um, run run around the corner, down the alley, um, into Max's encampment. And, um, and, and, uh, and to Hank's encampment and set a candle on a pizza box to prepare to cook a bag of heroin. But Max's syringe jams. Hank reaches into his sock, pulls out another syringe, handing it to Max apologetically. The highway patrol police took all my clean ones too. Max shrugs. He was evicted from his encampment last week too, and also lost all his clean syringes. But then he squints distastefully because Hank's syringes have, ha, ha, syringe has been used so many times that the numbering on the chamber is worn off. Cursing, he also notes a burr on the tip of the needle. Hank grabs it back, licks the point to confirm the defect, and quickly files it down on a rock, alternately licking and filing until he can no longer feel the burr with his tongue. Max is the one treating, so Hank deferentially hands the needle back to Max eagerly and waits for his turn to prepare what's called a cotton shot from the, 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 dry, the, the leftovers in the bottom of the cooker. And um, now, uh, believe it or not, the homeless heroin injectors and crack smokers we befriended um, were all well educated about the risks of propagating blood-borne diseases, especially HIV, from injection drug use. And um, in some sense, uh, this is a, um, a, a, a great um, sort of achievement of, of public health, that, that these messages are um, available and, and, and they're actually commonsensical on, on the street. Um, now, most of us, of course, would see this sharing between Max and Hank as obviously dangerous, unfortunate, and, and even irresponsible, or, um, you know, some of us might simply dismiss it as, as ignorance. But the health priority of, of a heroin users, of a heroin user, is to avoid opiate withdrawals above everything else. That's the number one priority. So sharing in this case becomes a social responsibility and also an expression of interpersonal friendly generosity and mutual care, as well as, as, as self-interest, because that obliges in the future the other person to share with you when you're in opiate um, withdrawal. In other words, Max is saving Hank from overwhelming, um, um, agonizing uh, symptoms of, of, uh, of bone-wrenching pain um, by giving him the dirty leftovers of his uh, cooker and, and dirty cotton. Max is also protecting himself in the future because next time he is dope sick, Hank, as I was saying, will be willing to lend him the, the godsend of a dirty needle filled with his dregs. So we constantly saw this kind of reciprocal gift giving, including food, blankets, temporary shelter, etc. We also saw them stealing from each other regularly. It doesn't one doesn't preclude the other. It's a sort of complicated thing. Um, um, and uh, what was most interesting is that they almost always pooled money to buy heroin, uh, and in that and and it, because that is precisely what achieved the the minimal levels of trust. Uh, that are necessary and the familiarity that's necessary to keep them in community and familiar with the techniques of, of, defi of dividing up um, uh, equivalent amounts and fair amounts of whatever amount of money each one contributed. So um, from an anthropological um, perspective, these risky acts of sharing and gift giving form um, a moral economy of valuable reciprocal relations and reciprocal obligations. There's a survival imperative in the case of, of, of people surviving on the street to, uh, who are addicted to participate in this moral economy in order to decrease their future risk of finding themselves alone and isolated, beset by with withdrawal symptoms and unable to go out and beg or steal or, or work um, to get themselves well again. Now, to better understand this logic for risk, um, uh, you need to learn how to inject heroin uh, on the street and how, to, how it gets split up accurately without the benefit of running water or soap or a safe private environment. The heroin that we have uh, west of the Mississippi um, is known as, black, as Me Mexican black tar. The cartels have the country 
uh, divided up on the East Coast, they have a, a, a fine white powder. Um, and this Mexican uh, black tar doesn't dissolve well. Um, it, it has to be heated in order to dissolve it, unlike the powder heroin on the East Coast. And it has to be stirred. Um, uh, note how he, in this case, he's crushing it. Uh, with the filthy top of his syringe in order to make sure that it's completely um, completely well um, um, dissolved. Um, then it has to be carefully measured uh, as units in a syringe for equal division, so you can keep track of how much each person owes, how much each person has contributed, so that everyone can feel that this was a fair exchange or else they'll start fighting uh, with each other. It's not like they're saints <laughs> with each other. Um, um, in short, to survive and avoid dope sickness, they participate then in this moral economy cycle of gift giving and debt, which forces them logistically to share common cookers, a crushed beer can in this case, um, and common rinse water and common uh, cotton filters. Um, so this, of course, directly contradicts um, um, public health's biomedicine's understanding of moral and rational scientific behavior in the face of inve infectious disease. Um, but for them, it's just practical and imperative um, to stay healthy is to share. Um, they do usually, as, as I was saying, avoid direct needle sharing. So it's not as if um, they're not listening to public health messages at the same time. And in, in fact, they are listening uh, to public health messages, and that's precisely one of the reasons why they avoid uh, institutional medical settings. Their, um, their, um, their, their illegality, their non-normative, non non-conventional non appearance, and their forms of interpersonal interaction, which are sharpened to be rough and aggressive with each other to survive, um, are not uh, received well in our medical settings. Um, so they avoid those medical settings. Um, and they uh, don't generally come in to seek services unless they're starting to die or in extraordinary levels of pain. Um, and instead, they invest in outlaw identities to pursue drugs with a self-destructive intensity akin almost to a devotion. They actually call themselves um, uh, righteous dope fiends, that's, that's an expression, um, and hence the, the title of the photoethnography that Jeff and I um, wrote about them. Now, um, in, in here we can see how the criminalization, not just of heroin, but also of syringes, has pushed people into the absolutely worst place we would want them to ingest, to inject. And this is sort of that where you see very clearly that structural force. This is in no one's interest to inject here, but it's actually the safest and from the injector's perspective, the healthiest place to inject. Because what he's most worried about is getting arrested. You, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a um in a liberal city like San Francisco, all the judges will throw out the arrest of a homeless heroin addict. They're throwing up in the courtroom. They smell bad. They, the judge just wants to get them out. They they don't they're they're not fighting the war on drugs in that kind of a way. The police are, however, um, and they know that the punishment is going through 48 hours to get processed to the courts, so that you get thrown into those um, withdrawal symptoms. And that's just for carrying a syringe. Or 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 uh, or, um, um, uh, or having um, so, you know a small amount on you. Um, so from his perspective, there's no way that uh, this is surrounded by a, a swampy a, 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 a set of swampy pu uh, puddles around. There's no no police officer in his in his or her right mind is going to go running through there to arrest him. He can take his time and and try to find a vein, or in this case, he's just muscling his his veins are burnt out. So, um, in contrast, this is a safe injection site uh, in, uh, in, in, in Canada, um, uh, uh, where public health has prioritized um, 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 you know, con concerns of, of bringing, uh, harm reduction concerns of bringing um, addicts into safer spaces rather than uh, zero tolerance policing. Um, and the World Health Organization has, uh, has um, uh, you know, has, has reckon, recommended as a, as a best public health practice for preventing HIV infection and active drug users, um, this, this concept of harm reduction, which I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with. I, I won't have time to do justice to, to the concept, but, um, but, it, but, um, but even actually the UN Office of Drug Control has, has declared it a best government uh, policy. Um, 
Although, um, ironically, our NIH project officers advise us not to use the word harm reduction when we submit grant proposals. It's just our country is just way out of line uh, with respect to that uh, compared to most European countries. Um, my grant actually was singled out as an immoral grant because I was naive at first and was using that kind of language, and it got investigated for that reason. Um, um, there are no magic cures for the complications associated with substance abuse, but harm reduction does offer an effective strategy to reduce pain and suffering of people who otherwise have a, a, a very high mortality and morbidity. And uh, more subtly, it prevents that hostile and negative iatrogenic interface with addicted patients. Um, and and, and with, it, it actually extends to any patients with, um, with, with, um, with, um, who, who, are, who have um, complicated chronic um, lifestyle caused conditions that are, that are difficult to, uh, to, um, to, to shake, to, to, that, that are difficult to, to um, and, and because uh, whatever, diabetes, um, cardiovascular disease, um, if, if, and, and, and so harm reduction would work as, just as well in, in those kinds of setting as opposed to uh, alienating the, the patient and having them retreat from any interface with services and just to give up or become more attached to, uh, to their lifestyle act activities that are, um, that are making them sick. Um, and as I was saying, um, oh, so the examples of harm reduction are, are, uh, are diverse. The most extraordinary, that's hard to believe, uh, is uh, countries that, that actually prescribe, it's, it's too commonsensical to be believed, to long-term heroin injectors, they actually just prescribe them clean, pure heroin. Uh, Switzerland is, is the country that pioneered that and has had that as policy for over 10 years. Um, and their outcomes are rather extraordinary. They have more people in the heroin prescription program going into pure abstinence, just completely leaving heroin, than the proportion who goes in, it goes into abstinence from methadone programs and from abstinence only programs. So it gives you an idea of how, because what happens is when you're getting the heroin and when a nurse is sort of telling you, wash your hands and you're tough and you have scars and, and tattoos all over, um, you all of a sudden get bored with this, or some of you will get bored with this activity. You actually have to figure out what's going on that make you um, have to have it every day. Um, at least that's one of their hypotheses. They, they, no one can figure out what, actually on some level how why that um, has worked. Um, uh, and um, and in, in, as you can just see, Quickly from 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 headlines, um, it, it's 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 in many countries it's just taken as common sense. Even the right and left wing parties are both for harm reduction in, in Denmark, for example. Um, now, in contrast, um, Sunny in this photo was just released from the San Francisco General Hospital with no painkiller after a deep carving and scraping of an abscess for which he had been avoiding treatment um, and that had gotten complicated. He was in excruciating pain uh, from a gust of wind right here, didn't even have a bandage. Um, there's a rigorous quantitative literature that actually there was a long article in the New York Times yesterday reviewing to my surprise, quite a, you know, quite an anecdotal bit of it, um, on the black-white disparities in access to analgesic care in the United States. Um, and it includes things like um, findings such as white children being three times as likely as black children to receive opioids in the emergency room for appendicitis. Um, so the stakes are obviously high. Uh, in the poor treatment uh, delivered to vulnerable populations and to the, the negative cycles that, um, that, that clinical services get into uh, with respect to the population. And I just want to end because um, uh, it, 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 we don't have time. Um, I, given your extraordinary ex expertise, I wanted to just throw up here the structural vulnerability uh, assessment tool or checklist, um, um, which which is intended to extend the medical gaze and purview to, um, to, to integrated social services, supportive social services for medical conditions. Um, and I uploaded to the Google Drive an article that we have in press in academic medicine, which is proposing uh, this structural vulnerability tool for medical education and clinical, clinical settings in case there's someone who might be interested in 
taking a closer look at it. Um, and this builds on the growing literature that's, um, that's available documenting the success of pilot programs that identify what, what, what get called high utilizers of emergency rooms or frequent flyers, more, more, um, more stigmatic in, in, in more common terms, in order to shower them with medical, mental health, and social services delivered by multidisciplinary clinical and social service teams. Um, the questions in bold uh, in each section then, uh, um, within each domain of structural vulnerability, function as initial screens that could potentially be quantified. Uh, they're also followed by qualitative assessment probes to elicit more detail and context so that one could use the one could use this this um, this this tool or checklist, um, you know, either qualitatively or quantitatively. Um, and it has, of course, um, this assessment tool, a broader agenda to reinvigorate and extend the traditional clinical social history, which, um, which is really done very routinely, if it's done at all, um, uh, beyond its narrow range of risk behaviors to enable providers to address negative health outcomes imposed by social determinants of health. Strategically, um, it could also justify institutionally to the cost utilization review committees that terrify clinicians, um, uh, the, um, the mobilization and coordination of complementary resources, both inside and outside the, the, the clinical setting for populations who otherwise are actually very expensive in addition to suffering. Now, ultimately, this adaptation of the social science concept into clinical practice could perhaps also orient healthcare providers towards pol more policy leadership to reduce health disparities and foster health equity. I think that's especially important in the United States with our, our extraordinary right-wing shift over the past 30 years. Health remains this neutral category and can say very subversive, very radical things in completely technocratic terms that are express that are basically believed as a legitimate human right in general common sense, access to health, you know, access to not suffering physically. Um, so now, of course, the risk, and I'll stop with this, is that it would become yet another bureaucrat bureaucratic hoop on the computer checklist um, that distracts time-stressed nurses and doctors and social workers from the actual vulnerable patient who's in front of them. Um, so um, I want to thank you for taking the time to listen, and Vivek for inviting me here, and I enjoyed meeting you. With you. I will tell you. Uh, any 